the Middle Podcast. The podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. What is up, Slackers? It is time for another episode of the Stuck in the Middle podcast. The podcast about the music, movies, and culture of Generation X, and I am your host, Jason Eck. I'm going to take us back to 1988. Well, maybe it was 1989. 1989. I already blew the opening. I had it in my head 1988, because that's when I started my freshman year of high school. But of course, that goes over into 1989. So it makes perfect sense. And I'm talking about one day I get home from school. So I had a part-time job at a local grocery store back in my hometown of Meriden, Connecticut called Waldbaums. W-A-L-D-B-A-U-M apostrophe S. Waldbaums. I was a bag boy. I was a bag boy. And of course we went and we got the uh, the carts, the, the shopping carts from the parking lot, and I would listen to music. I would listen to tons of music. I had my Walkman, and I remember it would be rain or shine or snow. I'm out there getting those things, listening to whatever music I wanted to at the moment. A lot of anthrax at that time. Motley Crue, stuff like that. But 1989, I come into the door, and I flip on the TV, and I grab myself a snack or whatever it was. And in my memory, I recall it being VJ Adam Curry. Now, I don't know what show it was. I don't know what show it was. I don't know. I can't remember exactly what time of day this was because my shifts weren't particularly long at that age. And they're saying there's a new song by this band. Now, there was nothing else really said about the band. Just that there's this new song by this California band by the name of Faith No More, and here's the first single off their new record, The Real Thing. I'm like, okay, well, what is it? And the opening strains of a song called From Out of Nowhere begin, and it's keyboards and guitars, and it sounds like nothing that I'd heard at that time, like absolutely nothing I'd never heard before, period. Just the, there was something orchestral about it, but also something very heavy about it. And then this guy starts singing. And he sounds like no other singer out there right now. Now, there's going to be a whole bunch of chatter about how there's another guy in another band from California that has sa- said and claimed that the lead singer of Faith No More maybe aped his style a little bit, maybe for a minute in 1988 and 89 and all that time period. But certainly, not much longer. So this song hooks me. Like, I am blown away. And the keyboard player is like, I don't know, I think in that video he's got like a later hosen maybe. I don't know. Cowboy. No, he's wearing cowboy gear. He's got like a, uh, uh, a cowboy shirt, a western style shirt. The bass player looks like a metal head. The guitar player is this big guy with this long thick black hair, curly black hair, these red horn-rimmed glasses like Sally Jesse Raphael. And he's just a shredder. And this drummer who's just full of energy, like this kinetic, frenetic energy behind the kit with these long dreads. And the singer looks like a kid, looks like a baby. And he's got the weirdest, most awkward dance moves that you've ever seen. But his voice is just enveloping me. This, of course, is band Faith No More. Faith No More, the real thing record, which was their breakthrough. But the first time that I had heard them was from out of nowhere. So the band is Mike Patton on lead vocals. And in my estimation, Mike Patton is the greatest singular vocalist. Now, I didn't say singer, although he can sing. 
He can sing, sing, but vocalist because of the things he's done over his career. Jim Martin, lead guitar, who is good friends with James Hetfield of Metallica and has been credited maybe with some of their early riffage, particularly, I think, the post-Mustaine days. You have Roddy Bottom, who is, uh, you know, one of the first um, out-of-the-closet rock stars. I think like a decade prior to like Rob Halford from Judas Priest was Roddy Bottom. He wasn't hiding anything with the name, but he's this orchestral style keyboardist. Billy Gould, he's he's one of the most versatile, goes back and forth between a, a slap bass style that can rival somebody like a like a flea or a or a less clay pool, but then can just play super heavy and alternate between finger picking and using a pick. Crazy good. Crazy good. And then Mike Borden. There's another song on the Real Thing record that I think he he shines like no other. And actually, it's a cover song. And he does, and and some will say, how dare you, sir? He outdrums Bill Ward on a Black Sabbath classic. But I'm hooked by this band. I'm hooked by this band. And by the time I actually went ahead, had the money to go and get the album, they had dropped their second single from the record. And this, of course, is the song that most mainstream people know. If you say Faith No More, I do think most people of a certain age, particularly our generation, are going to say, hey, I know that band. That's the epic, epic band. Epic was a huge hit. Top 10 hit. In the United States, I think it went higher on the charts elsewhere. But nevertheless, I I will say that it's probably not a song that, like, if I'm playing, like, a playlist, like a best of or an essentials, like, I'll listen to it just because it's such an important part of their history. Nowhere near their best song. Nowhere near their best song. And there are songs by their original singer, which we'll get into that in a moment, that are better than Epic. But they become a household name. A household name. And everyone sings the song. But it's this weird rap metal. And then the whole closing piece is symphonic. It makes no sense. It makes no sense on on paper, if you will, of how do you craft a hit single. This ain't it. Yet, it was the perfect song for the time. So many people have talked about it, and I've talked about it certainly on the podcast, that grunge music is what killed the hairband. But Faith No More was one of those bridge bands that that kind of lived in these different worlds because they were doing this funk metal hybrid, and and whether you love it or hate it, they are the, the forefathers of what become new metal. The Corns, the Limp Biscuits, the Slipknots. But they were doing something that was very, very different, sounded very strange, bridging all these worlds, and the heavy bands were really into them. But so were the hair metal bands. And I remember people like Nikki Six from Motley Crue saying, man, this band Faith No More is crazy good. They're doing stuff that nobody else is doing. Same thing with Hatfield. Of course, Hatfield's biased because he's friends with Jim. But, I mean, these guys are getting a ton of attention. So, back then, a lot of the information that we got about bands was from magazines. So, the the Metal Edges, the Kerrangs, and things like that. So, it was in that magazine that I read about the tour, the early part of the tour, for the real thing. So, usually, the bands will put out the record, then they tour. So when From Out of Nowhere came out, it didn't make this big dent right away, right? So they still stayed at this very underground level. They're on a a medium size independent punk label that was being distributed either by Reprise or Warner Brothers, whatever it is. So they had major distribution. But their tour, the first tour that Mike Patton did with Faith No More, 
get this, the the headlining band was Canadian, and I'm just going to say metal band because that's the only way I can really describe it, um, Voivod, Soundgarden, and Faith No More. And this is Soundgarden before Bad Motorfinger. What a crazy bill in small clubs. Obviously, both of those bands eclipsed Voivod. But that's kind of where they were cutting their teeth. And think about the bands that they were having a relationship with. A band like Soundgarden. So Epic, huge hit. The next one is falling to pieces. They did a radio, like, remastering of it. Not... I didn't like it as much as the the album version. But again, Epic and Falling to Pieces are, are not the songs that I hang my hat on. But what you were seeing in this album was a... It's one thing to say a diversity, right? And I'm going to use a band like Queen. Queen could do a heavy, heavy rock song like Stone Cold Crazy. Some crazy opera like Bohemian Rhapsody. Or a beat-driven song, like Another One Bites the Dust. Like, just a very diverse group. But really, even, you go back to Led Zeppelin. Once Led Zeppelin broke, broke free from the just the pure blues-based stuff and began to experiment, I think about songs like Fool in the Rain, Love Fool in the Rain, like these different rhythms and styles, and kind of committing to another style, but still within their own style. But Faith No More was much like Queen, actually trying to delve into a genre and not necessarily be completely authentic to that genre, but they would bring the different things that they're listening to. So when you take a look at the track list for the real thing, and I'm just going to go through this this first record in some detail because I'll just tell you, so as a singer, this album changed my life. And it changed my entire perspective on music. Now, it took me a while to start to get deeper and deeper to things that maybe would be a little bit more avant-garde or a little bit more challenging. But this first record uh, with Mike Patton was really moving into a direction that would fully realize itself later on. So like I said, so the first three tracks on the record are the first three singles, just right right off the bat. From out of nowhere, epic, falling to pieces. But the next track after falling to pieces is surprise, you're dead. Ha 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 ha, open your eyes. This is a thrash song. And the riffage is very reminiscent of Metallica. So if you go and listen to it, you'll be like, ah, oh, I, I, I hear that. But it's a thrash metal song. So the guy who's singing, you know, you want it all, but you can't have it is literally barking. Surprise, you're dead. Number five, zombie eaters. So remember this very quickly. Back in those days, I talked about having a Walkman. And some of the older Gen Xers are going to, you know, relate to this as well, or when you bought vinyl and you flipped over, and I had vinyl as well. So how you paste a record mattered. So it's always interesting to me how they paced this record with number five and number six. So number five is a song called Zombie Eaters. Now, Zombie Eaters, lyrically, what you think is a a journey about a baby. A baby. And like babies are like zombies. They just have to feed. They feed, they excrete, they cry. And that is their existence for the early part of their lives. So the zombie eaters. Five minutes and five, uh, 58 seconds. So almost a six minute song that starts off. So again, we just come off of Surprise You're Dead, which is all to acoustic guitar with these little flourishes, beautiful little flourishes. And then it takes you on quite a journey. Really baffling the first time you hear it. But it was showing that they definitely saw the world differently. Followed by the title track, The Real Thing, which starts off with just, uh, 
I'm not sure what the actual term is, but when the drummer is just using the side of their drumstick on the snare and it's do dun do 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 da. And I believe, I believe it's a love song. The real thing. It's beautiful, but it's also heavy. So heavy. You know, the real thing, the essence of the soul. The next track then, number seven, is New Wave. Real, all keyboards, and it's called Underwater Love, and it's a it's a pop song about drowning your loved one, which I guess is not so different from some other bands at the time. But it's so poppy and peppy. Hold me closer, my underwater love. The Morning After comes next, which is about a vampire, I think. I think it's vampire. Um, I I can't really describe it as a song. Um, it's it's I don't know. It's probably the closest uh, thing to. No, I I don't have a, a an adequate comparison for it. I guess it's just a, a a rock song, but it's got that very thick bass. Um, doom, doom, doom. yeah. Just, it's really cool. Um, then Woodpecker from Mars, which is an instrumental, um, very orchestral. So it's really, it's a, it's a blending of, um, you know, the keyboards. But it's, it's interesting is that the music is attributed to Jim Martin and Mike Borden, the drummer. It's really, really curious because there's a lot of, of the keyboards come into play, which is obviously Roddy Bottom. Now, I had the, I guess, extended version or the, the bonus tracks, if you will. So this has it out of order from, from the way I believe I had it. Whereas a song called Edge of the World. Now, I can only describe this song as a rap pack, like Frank Sinatra. Like you can just imagine Mike Patton. Sitting next to the, just got his, uh, his elbow resting on the piano and crooning. It's a crooning song about a, a man who is courting a much younger woman. And then finally, I mentioned earlier, Mike Borden killing it on a, on a Black Sabbath song. And Mike Patton's voice in particular as, as, an emulation in many ways of, of Ozzy when he was in, in this vocal range, in this tone at the time. This is my favorite version of War Pigs. And I know the original is the original, and I love Black Sabbath. I love Ozzy. Do not get me wrong. This rendition is, for lack of a better term, the sickest thing I've ever heard. Particularly at the time, just the best cover of a Black Sabbath song, and and this is better than than uh, oh gosh, uh, Anthrax, um, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. I mean, this is this is better. This is truly one of the greatest cover songs ever recorded. So people talk about the. Um, now, obviously, it's not quite the same. It's in my own mind that it reaches this level because I don't think they ever released it as a single. They did it live, you know, so many times. But people will talk about the, you know, the Hendrix Dylan thing. That That's this for me. This is my War Pigs. I highly recommend it and you check it out. So this first record. Now, when I say first record, first record with Mike Patton. First record with Mike Patton. Really like I said, completely changed my view on music. It really did completely change my my view on music. Now, what happened around the same time, and I, and I don't want to go too far down a, a rabbit hole with this, 
Um, so they also, Mike Patton has a number of other projects, but how he was discovered was that Jim Martin had a demo tape of this band called Mr. Bungle, who had a demo tape called The Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny. And it was thrash, like pure thrash, weird, violent, aggressive thrash. And uh, I I don't know. I I mean, this is how, uh, so the guitar player from Mr. Bungle described it this way. He said that the band style uh, was kind of a mixture of uh, Slayer, uh, Merciful Fate, you know, King Diamond, and uh, The Specials and Fishbone. And that seems about right, honestly. But because of the fact <laughs> that Mike Patton had blown up with Epic, with Faith No More, he parlays that into an opportunity to get his high school band, his high school buddies, a record deal with Warner Brothers. And in 1991, they put out the Mr. Bungle record. Now, I will I will tell you, I both highly recommend and also say don't ever buy this record all at the same time. You have to have a particular palette for it. I happen to have that palette. I find this to be a twisted beautiful masterpiece and it's not anywhere near their best record but i don't want to get too far into the mr bungle thing but you'll kind of hear if you listen to that mr bungle record what you you shouldn't be surprised by what came next for faith no more so before we get into the next record with mike Patton, i just want to do a quick loop back now, Carlson and I, uh, on one of the podcasts, talked about how he went and saw the Bad Brains with a guy called Chuck Mosley. Now, Chuck Mosley was the original vocalist for Faith No More, and they had two records out before that. They had Introduce Yourself, which was, I think, the first one on Slash Records, which, again, pretty good size, you know, record company with a distribution deal. And before that, they had We Care A Lot. And I think they had We Care A Lot again on Introduce Yourself, I'm trying to remember, uh, without going track by track. But when you hear the power and the quality of Mike Patton as a, a lyricist, as a vocalist, you go, this is the right band with the right guy. However, there are numerous songs with Chuck Mosley that hold up and still have very much that Faith No More sound. That Faith No More sound that existed through the real thing. And that's where I wanted to stop before we talk about the next record. Because there are even some vocal runs and lines and tones and phrasings that Mike Patton used, even though he wrote all the lyrics to the album, that were reminiscent of Chuck. And it just, it worked. It worked really, really well. But there are a number of really great Chuck Mosley songs. So if you're ever bored, you want to listen to stuff like, you know, We Care A Lot and Ann's Song, uh, Chinese Arithmetic, which is a terrible name for, for a song, but they were definitely showing where they were headed. Like, you could you could hear it. You could hear how it was developing and kind of coalescing into a particular sound. So one of the things that they talked about in their early days is that it was always meant to be not a not a literal battle, but a, a musical battle and interplay between the keyboards, which are associated more with pop music, or even, like I said, you know, orchestral and, and those kind of things, or new wave, hip-hop even. And you have this heavy thrash metal guitarist, right? So they're doing... Like this interplay, it's almost like they're 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 fighting and they're somehow meeting in the middle and creating this other sound. But with the, those early records, it was still almost like these separate entities 
and it hadn't really made into that that beautiful gel. But by the time that the real thing came along, they'd kind of figured out this formula. So I said that each track, as you're going along, are all these different genres. But it's also that they didn't... They, they didn't really... They emulated the genre. They, they touched upon it. They made something that was a... It was analogous to it, but it wasn't actually in that genre, per se. It was Faith No More doing their take on it. And that will be important later on. So we'll put a nail in that, or a pin in that, and we'll come back. So, just want to give a little shout-out to Chuck Mosley, because it was important. So 1992, just a few weeks, or probably the week that I graduated from high school. The follow-up. So now, here's my favorite band. My favorite band at that time. Still is. They have a new record, and it's senior year. We're getting ready to graduate. Sweet! I can't wait! And they drop the first single, and I'm like, this is weird! I... what? So it took me a couple of listens, and I'm like, okay. Midlife Crisis, first single off the record. This is different. Mike Patton was singing differently. He still had this, this so he, he kind of had this whiny tone, very whiny, very nasal tone all throughout the real thing. But now, yeah, he would jump into some other registers throughout that first record, but now it was something very different. Just a lot of that. And shrieks and screams. And so that's the first single. I'm like, okay, well, this is this is interesting. Let me go ahead and so of course I I bought it. And the opening song is basically a televangelist for for lack of a better term or a or a QVC announcer and it kind of starts in, in the same way it, it, there's reminiscent tones of keyboard and guitar of of from out of nowhere but then it goes into some really weird direction so i almost don't want to get into track by track even though this this record is i don't know um groundbreaking like it literally was groundbreaking and I, I think it more than the real thing this is the album where everyone said what what is going on what are these guys doing and why is it so different than anything else that's been done before so there was a great line And, and it is completely appropriate, and it, it always it always sticks in my head because of the word that he uses. And he wrote that this album is one of the more complex and simply confounding records ever released by a major label, and another called it the most uncommercial follow-up to a hit record Ever. So Carlos had mentioned on on the episode, the re, the um, high school reunion episode, that the single "A Small Victory" is described as a song which seems to run Madam Butterfly through Metallica and Nile Rodgers, and it, re- it reveals a developing facility for combining unlikely elements into startlingly original concoctions. The song's malpractice, yeah, malpractice, oh, the song's malpractice and jizzlobber have been called art damaged death metal and nerve frazzling apocalyptic rock. By contrast, with accordion propelled midnight cowboy theme cover that follows, or it's been called a bizarro masterpiece 
citing the vocals as smarter and more accomplished than its predecessor. And uh, <laughs> Kerrang, which I mentioned earlier, uh, considered Angel Dust's variety of styles a personality disorder of sorts, which undermines its potential greatness. And Spin comment, remember Spin? There are slow, scary songs. It's not as much funk metal thrash as the average fan would expect. So I, I think that's really, those are some, those are some uh, appropriate encapsulations of the record. It, it's certainly how I, that first listen through, I was like, I, I don't know if I get it. Now, I am notoriously slow at embracing music, even by bands that I love. I am never, for the most part, well, I, I mentioned that when I first heard from out of nowhere, I was hooked. There, there's a, another band that first time I heard a song, I was kind of hooked, but they didn't become my favorite. But um, there's a song called Hum by a band called The Sheila Divine, and a, and a friend of mine played it for me. And I'm like, holy shit, that is amazing. Such an amazing, masterful vocal performance. So uh, Sheila Divine out of Boston, I would check them out. But it usually takes me a little while to warm up. So, you know, I would have friends who would let me borrow a, a cassette or a CD because I was going to take some time with it. And Angel Dust, it, it took me some time. It took me some time. But I'm not sure what the time period between when Midlife Crisis was released and A Small Victory came out. But I remember going and buying A Small Victory as its own single on on CD because there were a couple of remixes as well. Because that one, that one really immediately, that got me. That one got me of all the songs on the record. Very unique. And for some reason, and I've said this in my own head, and there are very few people that I can talk to about stuff like this, including Faith and More. There is a, a melody that exists within the song that for some reason really reminds me of Boz Skaggs. I don't know what it is, but it just, it, 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 there's something about it. Some of the vocal lines in there. Um, but it's a dance styled song with samples and beats. And, and my oldest son, and I think I said this on, on another episode too, he mentioned that, you know, this song's a vibe, man. This song is a vibe. Now that means that means good, but it creates something. It evokes a certain emotion. But the singles were Midlife Crisis, um, A Small Victory, and I don't think they released it in the States. And if they did, it didn't break on radio. And that's a song called Everything Everything's Ruined. Everything's Ruined has, in my opinion, the best guitar solo of any song ever. Better than Eddie Van Halen or Dimebag Daryl, Jimmy Page. Yes. So I'd mentioned when Justin was on the show that his father got it into my head that no matter what it was, the singer, the drummer, keyboards, guitar, whatever it was, it needed to serve the song. It didn't need, it didn't need to be complex. It didn't need to be long. It just, it needs to fit. And the guitar solo in a small victory, excuse me, in everything's ruined. It's perfect. It's perfect. Now, I'm not going to appall you all with wonderful audio of me vocalizing that entire guitar solo, which I have in my head as we speak. But do yourself a favor. Listen to the song, Everything's Ruined, from the piano to the the vocals and that killer, killer guitar solo. And... If you've never heard it before, I, I think you'll you'll appreciate it if you're a lover of sometimes confounding and challenging and complex music, although I consider that song to be a pop 
masterpiece. Yes, a pop masterpiece. But the songs on the record are, as it, as the reviewer said, seemingly disjointed. And they're throwing everything at the wall to see what would stick. And during the recording of the record, there was a major schism within the band. Because founding member Jim Martin, metal guy, he's challenged by what's happening. And I think in part because he's used to having it as there's still going to be metal. Yes, you're going to have the keyboards and these flourishes and, and these beautiful, you know, movements and sections, but there's that counterpoint of the heavy guitar, which there's a lot of heavy guitar on this record. Do not get me wrong, but they're trying to, hey, we've decided that we're going to do kind of a, a, a genre piece. It's going to be country, like a song like RV. But they, they, they don't really do country per se. Now, I don't know if those are constraints of Jim's guitar playing. He's a shredder, down picker, you know, like James. Now, obviously he alternate picks and does beautiful solos, but just that heavy, he's a chugger, right? Um, I don't think he could embrace actually delving fully into a particular genre. It was always in his mind, we're doing the Faith and the More version of it. So the only thing, so they, they do, um, they give credit for everything as a band, like the way that they did the liner notes and the publishing and all that. But when you look here on the track listing, Jim Martin, music written by, he he was on a song called Kindergarten, which is a great guitar-driven song. Uh, with a great solo as well, although it's been rumored that Billy Gould actually played the solo. Again, rumor and innuendo. And then a song called Crack Hitler. And he was like a crack Hitler. He wrote that. And then Jizz Lobber. You can guess what the song is about. Not going to delve into it. Also, super heavy. That was Jim Martin and Mike Patton together on that track. Just this crazy thick metal song. So this resulted in a fracture in the band and they had a major, major tour. So as headliners, they did, oh gosh, I I don't edit shows to go back and drop things in where they belong, but I just want to point out first time I saw Faith No More was on the Real Thing tour with Billy Idol. Billy Idol and Faith No More. It was a weird bill, but it worked beautifully. And that is the first time I heard Mike Patton do his beautiful rendition of the Nestle theme song. Beautiful, truly. So anyway, fast forward, back to the Angel Dust. They were doing their solo touring, uh, I believe with Helmet in support. So... That's a heavy show. And then they were the opening act for the joint headlining stadium tour of Guns N' Roses and Metallica. I told this story on the podcast before. I really wanted to see Faith No More. My ride heading up to the old Schaefer Stadium, the Foxborough Stadium where the Patriots play. My ride was in no rush to see Faith No More. Metallica and Guns N' Roses, in their estimation, was the show, and I didn't get to see them on this record. This most groundbreaking and genre-defying, and even kind of the record that launched a genre, if you will. So I missed them. Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and Faith No More. What a hell of a show. But after the tour was done, so was Jim Martin. And the rumor goes that he was fired 
by fax. F-A-X, fax. I don't know if that's true. That was someone from the management company. How that worked exactly. But that's pretty awful. So they get back in the studio. And they have to find a new guitar player. So I'd mentioned that Mike Patton had another band. And that band was Mr. Bungle. So he brought in his guitar player, which by, by all accounts, even though this is one of his friends, Mike Patton did not recommend Trey to the band. He's like, I, I vouch for his playing. Like he's a hell of a guitar player. But he's not necessarily reliable, (laughs) you know? Um, But they recorded this record. Now, this is where, when you start getting into fandoms, right? I mentioned that Empire Strikes Back is not my favorite album. (laughs) Album. Uh, that, that Empire Strikes Back is not my favorite film in the Star Wars franchise. And everyone's like, what? Of course it is the best. Not my opinion, right? I wrestle with this all the time because of how much I love the real thing. But I think the follow-up to Angel Dust, and, and people will be like, well, Angel Dust is the best. Because, again, it's like the Empire Strikes Back. It's dark. It's different. Everyone wants to say it's the best. It's like people who say that Paul's Boutique is the best. It's not. King for a day. Fool for a lifetime. Might be my favorite Faith No More record. Honestly. So the, the opening line, when you look at the Wikipedia page hits on exactly what I was just mentioning. So thank you for having the right information here. It was their first album recorded without longtime guitarist Jim Martin. The album showcased a variety of musical genres with Rolling Stone calling it, calling the result a genre shuffle. Okay. Genre shuffle. And This is where I believe the band had reached the level and and had reached the vision, achieved the vision that I think they all had and they couldn't actually attain with Jim. And that was, we're going to do a song, like a song like Evidence. Evidence is something that almost seems like it could be on a Commodore's record. I mean, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I mean, it's, it's a smooth soul song, right? There's no other way to describe it, but it's fully realized in that style because Trey doesn't go, now I'm going to play the metal over it. He just plays it straight, Right. He's got some wah going on, right? And it's just, it's a little funky, but like really funky. So before, if they were playing something that was kind of funky, it was all really derived from the guitar, from the bass. So that's when like Billy Gould would be playing slap bass and, you know, uh, Mike Borden would be playing something very much like almost like a hip hop beat, right? With (laughs) over top of it. Not so here. And, I, and my favorite song was not released as a single. And it wasn't until I saw them on the reunion tour that I was so pleased to see that it was a crowd-pleasing closer. And that's a, a song called Just a Man. This is also kind of a soul song. I mean, no other way to describe it. It has this weird little 
intersection, this little interlude right in the middle of the song. Uh, that's a little genre defying, but it's Mike Patton, full voiced, just killing it, killing it. But there's a song on here called Last to Know that's just got this great, thick riff. Dun, 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 dun. Ah, I, I, it's so good of a record. So, like, Get Out is like the first song. And it's like the first song that Mike Patton did all of it. The drums, the guitar, all of it. He wrote it all. Ricochet. Huh. Um, it's always funny until someone gets hurt and then it's just hilarious. Is that Ricochet? I think so. Uh, evidence. Uh, the gentle art of making enemies. That has been covered, I think. I think maybe Slipknot did, did a version of it. Wow. Just a heavy thrash metal song. Probably almost leaning towards, you know, getting into Bungle Terry territory. Star AD, it's like a, gosh, I don't even know how to describe that song at all. But I mean, you listen to some of these, you know, guitar, uh, excuse me, um, song titles like Carajo Vador. That's a, a song that's done in Portuguese. And it's basically a song about a guy who, as they describe it, the guy's a dick. Cuckoo for Kaka is just a weird avant-garde thrash metal song. Ugly in the morning with one of the craziest vocal lines from that whole last section of the song. Digging the Grave was their, their first single off the record. It's a straightforward rock song. Like, just a rock song. Perfect. Perfect. Take This Bottle is... I don't know how Take This Bottle hasn't been covered by a country artist yet. I don't know if any of y'all know any country artists, but they should be doing this song. It is amazing. I can wait to love in heaven. I can wait for you. So beautiful. And he's singing this lower register. King for a Day is prog rock. Prog rock. And a good friend of mine said it reminded her of the great Gatsby. And when you listen to the song, I think you can, you can get what she means there, but it's a really interesting song that it starts very, uh, it's acoustic. It's very atmospheric. And I think probably one of the best songs on the record. What a day is next. What a day, what a day. If you can look it in the face and hold your vomit, that, that probably gives you a little bit of a clue there. I mentioned last to know, and then just a man. So they also released, and I have it somewhere on vinyl. It was gifted to me. They did the entire record plus B-sides and bonus tracks as 45s. I forget how many 45s, but they have another one of my absolute favorite covers. And that is their version of the Bee Gees, I Started a Joke, which is a Robin Gibb vocal, by the way. And they also do Spanish Eyes by Engelbert Humperdinck. Amazing. So think about, think about the juxtaposition of artists. So they've done covers from Black Sabbath, The Commodores, music soundtracks. Um, here you are, Engelbert Humperdinck. Uh, they did covers of uh, Dead Kennedys and Jello Biafra. Just such an interesting, just such an interesting viewpoint or, or a view of the world and what music means. And when people ask Mike Patton, how do you write your lyrics? So I talked about a guitar solo fitting the song. It's like, well, the vocals just, they, they need to, to fit the song rhythmically. How does this word fit here? And you hold a note or you, whatever it is. So he says the songs aren't personal. They're all really either a character or just what he feels fits. Now, of course, he's also done some film scoring and, Soundtracks, he's done operatic pieces, uh, 
just all different kinds of, of music. But all the guys have done different projects, everything from pop punk to death metal to avant-garde. I mean, Patton was in Dillinger Escape Plan for a little while. So they've all done different things. And uh, Mike Borden, I mentioned, you know, the Black Sabbath thing. He was actually in Ozzy's band and then he was in Black Sabbath, which makes perfect sense because they probably went, wow, this guy's sick and let's bring him on board. I think it was uh, Mike Inez was playing bass with uh, Ozzy at that time when, when Mike Borden joined the band. So then... I moved to Boston, um, where I listened to this album the most. Let's see, 95? Yeah, 95. Wow. So, yeah, I was already in Boston when this came out. We're just about moving because this is March. Um, So just two years later, they put out an album that I don't think I listened to more than... Five times. Thoroughly, thoroughly unimpressed. And I'm like, is this like fulfilling like record label quotas? Okay, you got to give us X many records. Like, okay, we'll just, we'll just do it. So I remember I mentioned that Trace Bruants joined the band. Patton said, you probably shouldn't do that. He never toured the band. They, they completed King for a Day, which, okay, but quickly, let's roll back a little bit. On the King for a Day record, and maybe the reason I have such an affinity for it in general, is I think I saw them six, seven, eight times on that record. Pretty much anywhere that they played up here in the Northeast, I went to. And that included... With my girlfriend at the time, writing in on index cards to WAAF here in Boston, writing in on these cards to try and win tickets to a holiday, a Halloween show that they were doing. I forget what theater it was at. We ended up being up in the balcony. It was awesome. But um, we won. Yeah, we wrote all these cards. Leave your telephone number. You know, there was no text messages. There was no, you know, we'll just call your cell phone. It was, here's the landline of the house we were living in. Um, here's your contact information. And we just sent hundreds of these postcards in, in order to go ahead and win those tickets. Terrible bands opening up that had nothing to do with them, but saw them in all different size theaters. And I think that the The band that was opening up for them, at least on some of that tour, was a band called Milk Cult, which they have one record that really got some killer tunes on it, but they were also on Slash. And there was also a band called Melt Banana, and Melt Banana opened some of those shows as well. But it was really a great tour, Uh, but they had a guitar player with them called, uh, his name was Dean Menta, and he was a guitar tech for the band. He ended up becoming the lead guitar player, played the whole tour, But then when they got in the studio, he just didn't have the chops. He just couldn't write. And that's not a knock on him. A lot of guitar players can play other people's stuff really, really well, but they can't create their own riffs. They can't really write music. And that's okay. So he had to move on. Um, (laughs) this is, this is how, oh, this is what the band says. We didn't fire Dean because he was a jerk. We didn't fire Dean because of anything. It was just because we couldn't write. And he had already written songs, but it wasn't working. But he toured fine. So they ended up bringing this guy, John Hudson, who is... Okay, let, let, me, let me back up here. John Hudson comes in and they do this record called Album of the Year, and uh, how to put it? If Angel Dust put an exclamation point on Faith No More's trademark sound, trademark sound, the release of their 1997 coda, Album of the Year, planted the ellipses at the end of a career that was as charismatic and riveting as it was jarring. Interesting way to put it. Someone said it was a great album, but this was in 2015, not the time that it came out. 
They wrote, Album of the Year sounds mature, a blasphemous term for a band of self-professed oddballs who had a reputation as crass and scatological pranksters. All the humor on Album of the Year, right down to its title, feels a bit crestfallen and self-deprecating, as if the band had aged a decade since King for a Day. It is just not a great record, in my opinion, but perhaps it's time. And this is what's always great for the podcast. It starts bringing up some some juices get flowing and say, okay, maybe I need to go ahead and listen to this record. Maybe I just don't. I didn't. uh, I was at a different point in my life, I guess, really, when it came out. You know, it was very much a transitional time period. And sometimes that's that's uh, an issue with music, too. If it comes out at the right time or the, or the wrong time, as far as being able to identify with it. But, you know, looking back, there are a couple of songs that I will listen to. But it's it's all the stuff they released as singles. You know, Strip Search, um, Last Cup of Sorrow. I mean, it sounds good, but I just... Oh. Um, yeah, there's something just cheesy about it i just can't fully embrace it um but like you know ashes to ashes um you know they're they're good songs but i guess i need to sit down and listen to it again because it was a bummer and i don't think i saw them on this tour gosh i mean i i can't recall i think i must have 97? Yeah, I, I must have seen them. I must have seen them around that time. But they released Ashes to Ashes, Last Cup of Sorrow, and Strip Search all uh, May, August, and November of 97. You know, that Halloween show might have been 97 now that I think about it. No. No. Never mind. I'm just, I'm, I'm recounting time periods in my head, but I always think of it in terms of where I was working at a particular time. Uh, and I was working at a hotel in Boston in 96. So no, that timeline doesn't work up. So anyway, they kind of disappear. So I keep listening to stuff like Mr. Bungle. And I listen to some of Mike Patton's solo stuff. Great record that he has called Peeping Tom. That's the name of the band and the record. Some really, really cool stuff on there where he's collaborating with all different artists, including like Nora Jones. But they start doing these reunion shows. And then to my utter and absolute surprise, they release a record. May 19th, 2015. Called Sol Invictus which is Latin for unconquered son. So as much as I was like blasé about album of the year, I I was excited, but I was concerned. I was concerned because they were much younger men in 1997 than they were in 2015. It already seemed like kind of a middle of road, like that, that reviewer said, mature. It was also very milk toast. It was very bland, uncolorful. It was missing that faith no more spark. So they decide that the first song that they're going to drop, I, I could be wrong if I'm getting these backwards, I apologize, but the, the first two songs, um, one is called Superhero, but the other is... Um, Mother Trucker. I'm going to, I, I, I try to keep it without the explicit sticker on the podcast. But they're like these killer songs. And like Superhero, they did this like record store, like little, not a clinic, like a showcase of some of the new songs. And I was like, wh- where was this band? In 1997, where maybe I could have needed it, but maybe I wouldn't have identified with it. Maybe I needed to be at the place that I was in my life in 2015 as a husband, as a father, and all those kind of things. And I am getting older. And this record ends up being so freaking good. 
Now, for me, the standout track could never have been released on radio. It's a song called Matador. And I encourage you to listen to Matador, one of Patton's finest vocal performances, in my opinion, of of the entire discography. So I was very fortunate that my beautiful wife says, hey... I got you a birthday present. Now, I don't know if this is... Yeah, no, the record had already come out. Yeah, so the record came out in May. My birthday is in June. And I want to say this was maybe July, July or August. And I got to go see Faith No More for the first time in all these years at the... Well, Blue Hills Pavilion, it has all different names, Bank of America Pavilion. Anyway, it's an outdoor amphitheater style. The place is packed, and Faith No More is back. And their new songs that they play are getting such a great reaction, which is not always what happens when veteran bands release new music. Because that whole record, tour, single, like that whole cycle, that's very different now in music with streaming. You get the whole record at once. Yes, songs can get released to radio, but like an artist will have 10 songs in the top 10. None of them actually release on radio because they're streaming. But the new songs were mixed in with the old stuff and being so well regarded and really embraced. And the fans were enthusiastic and I was embarrassingly loud. And, and jumping and singing and so into that moment that my favorite band had come back with not only an amazing show where they sounded, I mean, astounding, phenomenal, but a record that is the best thing they'd done. In such a long time. Now, I don't know where I rank the record. It's above album of the year. I can tell you that. And there's some really heavy stuff, some silly stuff, but unlike the, the humor in something like, again, album of the year, the, the humor was so earnest, so honest, so quirky. They have a song called Sunny Side Up. It's it's about breakfast. You know what I mean? I'll be your leprechaun. <laughs> you know, Lucky Charms. Um, Tiptoe to the Sugar Bowl. Whoa. It's clever. It's tongue-in-cheek. It's not meant to be taken seriously. And it's fun. And the chorus is sunny side up. More than, one, more than one way to crack an egg. But then stuff like Cone of Shame is just sick and fierce. And then it's not like Black Friday, which is obviously a condemnation of capitalism. But I really recommend anyone who even had a, a passing fancy or enjoyment of Faith No More, check out Soul Invictus. It is, it is the, the story of a band that has come back from the dead to recapture a, a, a lost glory to become what they always should have or could have been and really reinvigorating themselves and their fan base. So this is where I want to give a little bit of a shout out to John Hudson. Tremendous performance on this record. Some really cool guitar work on it. And some of the things are reminiscent of of some of the prior guitarists of the band because there are certain tones and things that fit with how they 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 put their songs together but also uniquely his own so i'm happy for john hudson that he got a do over from that last album where he got to really shine and be a part of this now he doesn't have the same you know writing credits or anything so i don't know if they went in the studio and they said here play this I don't even care. He did get a writing credit on Superhero, which is a cool tune. But even if they said, hey, go record a solo, and he just went and banged it out, 
Good for him. He sounds great. Good tone. So kudos to John Hudson for having this opportunity. That, slackers, is my dive into my favorite band of all time. Faith No More. They are, as the reviewer said, complex and confounding. They can make brutal, violent music and beautiful, plaintive, gorgeous music, sometimes all within the same song. Now, as a singer, I will tell you, Mike Patton messed me up to some extent as a singer because I was looking at the the Jeff Tates and the, the Michael Sweets and the the, the really formal singers and wanting to learn the art of singing. And he's singing in weird ranges and octave shifts and flats and sharps and doing all these really weird things with his voice, which, of course, I tried to emulate. And I remember doing like a karaoke thing. And I was doing time after time, Cindy Lauper. This is at uh, my stepdad's place. And I make some weird octave jump where I'm going from, you know, the verse into the chorus. But instead of going up like one, I go up like two or three. And my stepdad's looking at me going, what? What What are you doing? Like, I don't get it. That was because of Mike Patton. It was something to emulate and try to accomplish because his vocal lines are sometimes really, really difficult. So go back to a song like A Small Victory and what he was singing. But honestly... My musical hero is Mike Patton. He makes some really weird music, and we could go all just – I could do the whole episode just on Patton and the stuff that, that he's done, including the most recent iteration of Mr. Bungle with Scott Ian from Anthrax playing rhythm guitar. How freaking cool is that with Dave Lombardo from Slayer on drums? Imagine being a bunch of dudes in high school playing thrash metal. Here are your heroes. They're now in your band. With Trey and Trevor Dunn and so cool. So, so cool. I love this band. I understand that many people may only remember Epic, but I ask you, go ahead, pop it on your, your Spotify or your Apple Music, wherever you get me. Go to, go, go to the record store and go buy it. Go get yourself some, some vinyl. And if you want to, I think some of this stuff is available on Ipecac Records, which is Mike Patton's label. I think they put out Soul Invictus on Ipecac. Check them out. Hope you enjoy them the way that I do. And I hope you have enjoyed this little excursion into my favorite. And if you like the episode, you know what you could do? You could like or subscribe to the episode. You could email me your feedback or comments at stuckinthemiddlepod at yahoo.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at StuckPodX. You can go over to my Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle, a Gen X podcast. Do all that stuff. But most importantly, please subscribe to the channel and recommend it if you're digging it to your friends or anyone that you think might be interested. So, until next time, later slackers.